Okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Yuki. I'm uh, one of Apache Cassandra committers since May 2012. And today I want to talk about uh, how Cassandra is used in the real world by showing several examples and why they chose Cassandra to drive the applications. So here is a company that using Cassandra. And over the past years, uh, Cassandra has been gaining more popularity. And these are the, uh, we, the companies that we uh, gather from the internet. So given that Cassandra is the open source project, uh, Probably uh, this is the tip of the iceberg, and probably more than thousands of companies now using Cassandra. So uh, what I want to start off today is uh, pick uh, three companies and their use cases uh, to show how Cassandra is used in those companies. And the three companies, uh, eBay, Disney, and Netflix, and probably uh, you are all familiar with those companies. So the first one I want to talk about today is the, uh, eBay. eBay is using Cassandra in several places in the applications. And one is uh, social signals, that is uh, like, want, or own buttons in the uh, item page. And they also use uh, Cassandra and Hadoop integration to analyze those uh, social data. And they are also using uh, hunch taste graph for Cassandra and many other time series data. Uh, many other, they have many other time series use cases using Cassandra. So, Time series data is uh, one of the most popular use cases in Cassandra. And it is a very good fit uh, because Cassandra's uh, nature of data modeling and the performance it gives. So here uh, I have a black background in green status. That is a web server log to track user activities on the site, and that is one of the examples of time series data. On the right side, uh, we have a monitoring tool, and this is uh, from our own Cassandra monitoring tool, but uh, with those monitoring tools, you measure performance of uh, applications or hardware, and that's the one kind of time series data. Or in general, uh, the financial data, like uh, stock price, is also considered uh, financial, uh, time series data. So uh, it is very good fit to use Cassandra. And eBay is uh, mainly using uh, time series data to uh, uh, time series data to store uh, store time series data to Cassandra. And one other thing that eBay is attracted by Cassandra is uh, motor data center support. So here uh, we have upper two is a cloud-based data center, and down there rectangles are uh, on-site data centers. And using Cassandra, uh, you can actually mix those data centers and duplicate data among those machines. And this is not an uh, ideal uh, picture, but uh, this is a actual working uh, setup for most, uh, many of my, uh, our data stacks customers are using. So this is uh, really a working practice for people. And one of the things that is uh, difficult when you are doing the multi data center setup is how do I increment the counters safely 
without any race condition. So easy, easy way is to solve this is to have one master and each machine talk to, talks to that master to increment the counter. But for the multi-data center setup, you often don't want to across the data. You, want, you don't want to go over the one link to talk to the specific master because that is slow to increment, increment just one counter. So uh, what we do in Cassandra is we allow each counter to increment locally and then replicate those counters asynchronously to the other data centers. So what I try to diagram here is that how it works in Cassandra. What we do is uh, we split the counter up. If I have three different replicas, like here in three different data centers, I will partition that counter across each of those replicas. So A here is in charge of uh, one partition at the top, and B and C are also uh, another partition, part of the partition. So what we have here is a counter with the initial value C, and uh, at the light, top right, uh, we add a counter increment of two, so, and what happened is that each of those increment, uh, its section of counter is incremented and then those get replicated across the cluster. So uh, at the bottom, everyone agrees to have the counter of value seven after adding two twice to three. And uh, next thing that eBay is using Cassandra is uh, Cassandra support for Hadoop. And Cassandra support Hadoop integration since uh, version 0. 0.6 back in 2010. And oftentimes uh, it still uh, get people confused because uh, Cassandra and Hadoop, uh, what's the difference? among those, but actually Cassandra and Hadoop are different thing, and they are not uh, competition each other, but rather they are uh, complement each other. Cassandra is used for processing real time, a lot of small size data uh, fast, and Hadoop is using for crunch those data and process it to produce some kind of analytics report. And you can use Cassandra configurable applications uh, feature so you can tell uh, those green machines to perform, only those green machines to perform uh, Hadoop uh, map reduce and while uh, those blue machines are serving real time data. And when you're doing the analytics stuff on green machines, it doesn't ever touch uh, real time data on blue machines. So you can uh, separate workload for real time and for analytics workload. And that's uh, what Cassandra is good. One of the uh, good things that Cassandra has to support Hadoop. And moving on to the next uh, use case, I want to talk about Disney. And Disney is using Cassandra to standardize on common platform across multiple applications. So, it's, so this is another paradigm that we see Cassandra being deployed a lot. And when you're doing 
standardization on the common platform, then uh, multi tenancies comes up. So how do I store or use a single cluster to drive multiple applications? Well, there's uh, two ways to do this. And if you have a huge uh, one Cassandra cluster, you can store multiple uh, applications. You can store data from multiple applications into that huge Cassandra cluster. Or if you, uh, you, have, you can have a cluster for each application. And, but uh, what Disney is doing is, uh, here uh, I pictured the diagram of uh, multiple application in each different color and stored in, uh, in one huge cluster. But uh, what Disney is doing is, uh, because each application has different performance characteristics, it is good to have uh, each cluster assigned to each application. And so the application that requires uh, more faster I.O., then you probably want to set up the cluster using SSD for only that application. For if you don't need that much I.O., uh, probably you can stick on the spinning disk. So the cost is more cheap. So one of the things that we've been working on in data stacks and in Cassandra community as well is to support the tool to uh, manage multiple data centers in easy way. And here is uh, our own uh, data stacks ops center tool. And at the bottom, you can see development and staging, production cluster, and you can manage those at one place. And oh, also, Netflix open source the, uh, the Cassandra management platform called Playam, and they are very focused on signing up and managing multiple cluster on the cloud. So uh, you can choose uh, several ways to manage your multiple cluster, multiple Cassandra cluster. And another thing that Disney was interested in Cassandra is the support for enterprise search. Cassandra offers a flex flexible in indexing API, and it offers a default column family based uh, indexing, secondary indexing, but you can plug in uh, whatever you want to use for uh, secondary index search. So uh, what we do at Datastax is we, can, we plugged in the solar indexing platform into the Cassandra so, uh, so that the data stored in Cassandra can be indexed right away using solar. And you can also query the Cassandra data using solar index. And that the one thing, the other thing that uh, Disney is attracted to use Cassandra. And the last use case I want to talk about is the Netflix. Uh, Netflix is uh, one of the largest uh, user of Cassandra, and I think the largest uh, Cassandra user on the cloud. So Netflix has been working on and using Cassandra for longer than anyone else at this point, I think. And there's a, a lot of things that they talk about Cassandra, but a few things that I want to talk about today is uh, how they are using the uh, Cassandra for SSD. And Cassandra is Cassandra's log structure storage engine is really good fit for solid state disk. And 
Here's a slide that uh, Rick Branson did last year about Cassandra and the solid state disk. And, but uh, to summarize that talk, uh, solid state disk drive has kind of a sector size. And if you are doing light to that sector, you will always uh, have to do the rewrite of whole that sector. So if you are using the database that do random writes, uh, you are wasting, uh, you, you are not uh, using SSD efficiently because of the nature of the SSD. And Cassandra, on the other hand, do only do the CTHL writes, so Cassandra can maximize the I.O. That gives the solid that gives from the solid state disk. And another thing that affected Netflix, attracted Netflix was uh, Cassandra is open source foundation. And there's many companies contributing the core Cassandra, including Net Netflix, and they have uh, own Apache Cassandra commit as well. And Netflix also contributed the tools and drivers to talk with Cassandra. And they open sourced a Java client called Astianax that they use for their own applications. Or the management platform called Priam and many other stuff. So uh, they are deeply involved in this uh, Cassandra open source community. So summarize these use case patterns. All of these Cassandra users are interested in high performance and massively scalable and no single point of failure, highly reliable and highly available uh, feature of the Cassandra. So here is a graph that was published last year in the VLDV, that, was, that is a conference for very large database. And in the paper, uh, researchers do uh, various uh, performance testing on uh, various NoSQL databases, including Cassandra. And as you can see, only Cassandra uh, scales linearly compared to other database products. And researchers called it the Cassandra in that paper. In terms of scalability, there is a clear winner throughout our experiments. Cassandra achieves the highest throughput for the maximum number of nodes in all experiments with a linear increasing throughput from 1 to 12 nodes. So uh, even in the academic world, uh, Cassandra is uh, recognized as true scalable database. The other things that I want to talk about is uh, high availability. Cassandra is designed for reliability and high availability at the core. So uh, free distributed design, no single point of failure, and you don't have to fail over at the node fail. And this is the picture of the classic partitioning with single point of failure. So you start off uh, with single machine, and as the data grows, you put the nodes and you divide the data into a different partition. And each of these partition has uh, own master and couple of slave machines. And when the master goes down, you have to fail over. And for, while the failover is happening, you cannot access the data in that partition. And if the master went down because of the network failure, and the network uh, comes up, uh, you will end up having two uh, masters 
in that cluster. So that's a, a weakness of failover and classic partitioning. And here I have the router at the bottom, and that's uh, the other thing that uh, weakens the classic partitioning because that router also is a single point of failure. So you have to uh, add another router, and you have to fail over when at that point also when the one router died. So this is uh, inherently a complex design of architecture. And on the other hand, uh, Cassandra is uh, fully distributed and knows a single point of failure. And each node uh, performs the same role. So there's no masters and no slaves. So uh, this is uh, what, what characterizes Cassandra as uh, highly available by the nature of the Cassandra's design. Let's look at uh, how Cassandra partitions the data across the cluster. Cassandra uh, divides the data into uh, row and columns as uh, relational databases do. So in this case, uh, username at the left is a primary key, and each row has the columns of age, car, and gender. And what we do to partition the data is to uh, take a primary key as a partition key. But uh, we don't use the primary key directly to partition the data. We use uh, the algorithm called uh, consistent hashing. So uh, we take out the primary key and we uh, take, uh, we, we do a hash operation, and traditionally Cassandra uses MD5 hash operation by default uh, to uh, process the primary key and turn that primary key into the 128-bit uh, address space. So uh, the primary key gym turns to the hash value of the 5e Hex, hex value of 5e, uh, 0 to something. And that's a low part of the uh, hashing. And we assign the hash also to the, the each node. So once we have the key has hashed, we are going to assign tokens to the node. and. If I have a uh, four node cluster here, I'm going to give each uh, hash value, or to we call it token, which is also a value of 128 bit uh, address space that function, hash function gives. And up, the, up there, uh, we have a node A, B, C, D, and each has a range of uh, hash values that the node is responsible to store the data. So uh, when we do storing the gym here, it goes to the node C, because node C uh, is responsible for uh, holding the data starting from 0x4 to 0x8, and gym's uh, hashed value is 5e0, start with 5e0. So it goes to node C, and the same thing goes on. And Carol, to store the Carol row, uh, we put that data in node D. And Johnny is for node C, uh, node A, I mean. And Susie is for node C. And here we called uh, Cassandra uh, cluster as the token link because uh, 
Uh, node A in particular is responsible for hex value from the, the end of uh, node D to uh, and wraps around to node A. So which is why Johnny is assigned to node A since it has a hex value of F4 and it uh, ends up with uh, node A. So that's how we pick the first replica. And what about additional replica? So how we place each replica is determined by what we call a replication strategy. And by default, we just chose the, de chose the node that is the next to the first replica node and goes clockwise. So uh, Carol's first replica is stored in node D, as, as I showed in previous uh, slide, and it goes clockwise. On, so it gets replicated into node A and node B, if, we, if I have a replication factor of C. So that's a default uh, replication strategy that Cassandra does, but uh, we can be smart if I know, uh, if the Cassandra knows uh, how the machines are spread across the data centers and certain lags. So usually you don't want to uh, lose the whole lag and you don't want to store the whole replica on the same lag because the network that connected to the certain lag dies, all the replicas uh, also become unavailable. So you can assign the, you can tell the Cassandra to uh, each machine is uh, where in the lock or in the data space each machine is located. So Cassandra automatic, automatically chose uh, each lock or data centers to store the replic replicas spread across the data uh, cluster. So, uh, Now you know how Cassandra uh, stores uh, data across the cluster, but uh, do we have to uh, query all replica, or do you have to write all replica at once? And, and the answer is no. Uh, so here's a tunable consistency comes up, and you can choose uh, to uh, act, uh, you can choose to uh, write one replica, and uh, I and Cassandra can uh, acknowledge that light, but uh, you can tell Cassandra to do a uh, free synchronous light by telling the Cassandra to do the light in consistency level of all, and there's a various uh, way, various uh, kind of consistency level that you can choose to read and write the data. So uh, you can choose the Cassandra's uh, performance based on your need, uh, application's needs. And I want to uh, briefly talk about the virtual nodes that we introduced in the latest Cassandra 1.2. And so far I talked about uh, the Cassandra cluster, uh, in the Cassandra cluster, each node has just one token assigned, but using virtual nodes, uh, you can assign more than one token to the cluster. And what that means is that uh, you can uh, create the cluster of uh, heterogeneous machines. So uh, you start with, started with a small box of clusters, and as you grow, uh, the cluster, you will add the more uh, decent version of the machine that has more capacity and more uh, faster cores. So uh, when you do that, uh, 
you don't want to uh, split the data evenly across the cluster. So uh, with the virtual nodes, you can assign the small amount of uh, tokens to the small boxes, and you can, uh, as I described here, you can assign more tokens to the uh, fat boxes that you recently added to the cluster, so that you, uh, the most of the data goes to the uh, fat boxes that you added decently. And the other thing that virtual nodes uh, gives you is that you can uh, reconstruct your failed node uh, faster by uh, free uh, using the nodes in the, in the Cassandra cluster. Because you have a small partition of the uh, token range spread across the, the cluster, you can uh, fully use those uh, machines to, um, in parallel to uh, recover all your data. And uh, there's a talk afternoon about virtual nodes, so uh, if you are interested in uh, you want to, uh, maybe you want to hear that uh, talk by Eric. And the last thing that I want to talk about today is how uh, you can data model the Cassandra data. Uh, Cassandra introduced Cassandra query language, or CQL, back in uh, version 0.8. And as you can see, uh, it looks just like the SQL, SQL. You can create a table using create table statement, and you can insert the data using insert into statement, and you can query the data using select statement. But uh, this is not as same as the SQL, and Cassandra's query language is strictly uh, focused on real time. So you cannot do joins, or you cannot do uh, subqueries. And right now, we don't have any aggregation function. Oh. And we, have, uh, we only have a limited support for order by, because we don't want to uh, sort millions of rows in memory to uh, return the result of your real-time query. And the one feature that uh, we added to Cassandra recently, and it is unique to Cassandra, is uh, we have a collection support built into the language. So in traditional relational database, when you want to have each user a multiple set of email, you model like this. You have a user's table, and you have user's email address table. And when you uh, query the users, you will join the user's addresses table to pull the emails that user has. And as I talked uh, earlier, the Cassandra doesn't support joins, and so you have to uh, data model in the normalized way. But uh, until the Cassandra version 1.2, uh, you have to do your own join to uh, achieve the same functionality here. But from the Cassandra 1.2, we don't have to uh, use the separate table to express that a user has multiple email address. And we now have a data type called set. So you, uh, in one table, you can have a multiple set of email addresses. And if you want to add uh, email address more than uh, one, you can just use update statement and use a plus operator to add the additional email address. So it's uh, really simple and 
it is a more natural way for Cassandra to express your data model. And the other thing that uh, this uh, is good about is it only does the I.O. for that specific uh, email address. So it is very performant uh, to do uh, compared to the relational database. And here I have only set, but we also support a data structure like list if you need uh, ordering, or we also support map so you can even the embed the key value in, inside your table. So uh, that's all for today. And if you have question, I think I have some time. So uh, Or uh, if you have the question later, uh, feel free to email me um, at UT at DataStacks. And I'm also hanging around the Cassandra free node IRC as UTIM. So uh, if you have a question later, uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you very much.